Hey everybody, it's Galmadex, and today is the launch of Cons of Tarkir on Magic Arena. This set initially came out in 2014, well before Magic Arena launched, so this will be our first opportunity to play with these cards on the program. Cons of Tarkir is one of the most famous and well-liked draft formats with some iconic theming of the enemy colors, as this is the set where we got the names Abzan, Jeskai, Soltai, Mardu, and Teemer. This format had a lot of cool mechanics with all five of these clans getting their own unique mechanic and Morph tying things together in every color. I have drafted the set a couple times years ago at my local game stores during Friday Night Magic events, but I didn't draft very often until Magic Arena launched, so this is going to be my first time really diving in deep with this format and I'm very excited to do so. So without further ado, let's just bust open these packs and see where the cards take us today. All right, here we are for our pack one pick one, and we have a sweet rare. There's a savage knuckle blade out of Teemer here that is green, blue, and red. This is a green, blue, and a red for a 4-4 that has several flexible activated abilities. You can give it haste the turn you played if you have perfect mana. If you have double red, blue, and green, then you just haste out your 4-4. But being able to also buff it for plus 2, plus 2 for 3 mana makes it really hard for this to lose in combat, being able to turn it into a 6-6 whenever you need to do so, and if you have the mana up against removal spells, you can even bounce this back to your hand with some blue mana, so that's a really nice way to keep it on board to kind of, well I guess technically take it off the board, but it's a really nice way to avoid your opponent's removal spells, make sure you can always still recast it, so we'll take the Savage Knuckle Blade here and go from there. For pack one pick two, ooh, this is quite the finisher. Flying crane technique is three, a blue, a red, and a white for an instance. Untap all creatures you control. They gain flying and double strike until end of turn. So if your opponent doesn't have a flying or reach creature, even if you haven't done a single point of damage to your opponent all game, this will immediately end the game if you have 10 power on the board. I guess unless they have great instant speed removal, but a lot of the spells in the format are powered down and that does not exclude removal. A lot of the removal is like 4 mana for 3 damage to a creature, or 5 if it has a plus and plus 1 counter on it, stuff like that. 2 mana to bounce something with not much extra text from there. So I feel like Flying Crane Technique is a pretty absurd finisher, because especially if you've already dealt a few points of damage to your opponent, which is very possible, very likely, once you've hit 6 mana, then you can easily end the game with this. Like, if you've dealt 6 to your opponent throughout the game, you only need 7 power of creatures out. If you have like a 4-4 four, four, and a 3-3, three, three, this ends the game, so take a Flying Crane Technique there. Obviously, it would be incredibly difficult to put both of these into the same deck because this set does have some mana fixing to help make sure you can play a three color deck. But playing five colors, especially five colors in a somewhat aggressive build, can be a lot more difficult. We'll have to spend picks very aggressively on mana fixing. For pack one, pick three, we just keep seeing really sweet cards that are completely different colors because now there's Chief of the Edge being probably the best card in the pack. A white and a black for a 3-2 that gives all of your other warriors plus 1 plus 0. So an overstatted creature for the mana cost that also buffs all your other creatures. Really, really good. I'm just going to take the Chief of the Edge here. We'll just be wide open. We've got one really powerful card deep into a bunch of different archetypes. For pack 1, pick number 4 now. Don't see anything great in white or black to go with our Chief of the Edge unless we just want to take the Scoured Barons. And this is an interesting time to point out. You should really try to keep in mind to be taking the enemy colored non-basic lands over the ally colored ones because there aren't any allied colored two color spells. So if you don't know the color pie very well, definitely just take a look at the back of a magic card. The colors that are right next to each other are allied colors, so like white and green. You don't really want to take a dual land like that because there's no multicolored cards that are white and green unless they're white, green, and black. But there are enemy colored cards like Chief of the Edge in white, black, and uh, Master of the Way in blue, red, which is going to be the pick here. It's going to be Master of the Way since there's nothing in blue or red, or sorry, white or black. Since there's nothing in white or black, we'll take the blue, red card because it fits into our deck with the Savage Knuckle Blade or our deck with the Flying Crane Technique. Again, not very likely that our deck has both of these cards, but if it ends up playing either one, if we're going Jeskai, Blue, Red, White, or Teemer in Blue, Red, Green, we can have a Master of the Way in there as a very decent removal spell. 
killing a smaller creature and drawing us a card while we do so. For pick number five, we've got a four mana four three, which would be fine. We've got a Mardu Hateblade for a playable one drop if we're going for a really aggressive Warriors deck with Chief of the Edge. We've got the mediocre bring low removal spell, but most of the removal looks pretty mediocre. Is Briber's Purse any good? Like a temporary kind of IC manipulator, but it feels pretty good to me. So you have to spend a bunch of mana onto X, like four mana plus ideally, but then four turns in a row, it's going to IC manipulate or something, stop a creature from attacking or blocking. I guess it's not as good as IC manipulator because IC manipulator stops that creature from attacking the turn you tap it and because it's tapped down it also stops it from blocking so that's pretty huge speaking of things that are pretty huge the afrit weapon master here when you flip this up a 4-3 first strike is quite large in the set i've been looking at all the creatures and pretty small pretty dirtily for the most part outside of the big green stuff and there's a lot of three mana two twos because morph we could also just take the thornwood falls for green blue fixing but we only have one card we've taken so far that is specifically in green blue so maybe we're pushing deeper into just sky blue red white over blue red green over teamer here for pick seven we've got a little a little unblockable mystic of the hidden way might be able to get a lot of damage in force away seems like a decent bounce spell because this is a set that has a lot of these big morph creatures that you want to play on the board and then flip up later for a ton of mana Bouncing a really high mana value creature can really slow down your opponent, so I think Force Away is pretty good too, but I like the idea of an, a nice little unblockable threat here, potentially. For pick 8, we don't see much that looks great. Uh, Singing Bell Strike is probably not great in the format since it is a bit slower. People can definitely get to that 6 mana that they need to basically save their creature from your Singing Bell Strike. They can just untap it and then hold it up as a blocker forever. Or if they want to get attacking with it, whenever they don't have anything to cast, they can attack and then just untap it. You've basically given their creature vigilance in the very late game, so don't love that. I'll just take an Inoch Tracker, I guess. Just some random red morph dork. Pick number nine. It's another Briber's Purse. Now that I thought about it, though, the fact that it's just for one turn, it's not like until your next turn. Um... It's made me a lot lower on the card now that I think about it. This pack looks pretty weak overall. Five mana for two toughness cards, pretty low, even with prowess. Maybe Firehoof Cavalry if we go really aggressive. I don't know. Pick number 10, bunch of nonsense here. Cri Crippling Chill might be a decent little tempo play. Witness of the Ages is always playable. Just color-wise, no matter what's happening with your mana. So 3 mana for a 2-2, two, two, then 5 mana to flip it up into a 4-4. Four, four. I don't know, I'll just take the Crippling Chill. Pick 11, not much here. It's just a rare draft, a Tomb of the Spirit Dragon. Pick number 12, 2 mana 2-2 two, two haste for super aggro stuff. But it has to attack each combat, so as soon as they flip something bigger than a 2-2, two, two, you're going to be in a bad position. I'll just take the blue creature here. There are some 3-mana 2-3s in this format that were designed to play really well against Morph cards, because Morph cards are 3-mana 2-2s two until you flip them up. They also happen to play incredibly well against uh, a 2-mana two 2-2 two two that has to attack. Like, if I play this and my opponent drops a 3-mana 2-3, two I am in a world of hurt. Or a 4-mana 2-3 Flying Vigilance. It's a bunch of really powerful cards here, but the coolest and the funnest one is Trail of Mystery. Two mana for an enchantment. Whenever a face-down creature enters the battlefield under your control, you can search your library for a basic, reveal it, put into your hand, then shuffle. So that's already great mana fixing for just like five color morphs. Um, but also as you're flipping your creatures face up, they're getting these buffs, these plus two plus two till end of turn. So you can really make combat miserable for your opponent. If you just have a morph on board and you have your trail of mystery out if you only have three or four mana up usually you wouldn't be able to flip a morph that's big enough to really ruin their attack but all of a sudden when anything you flip up gets plus two plus two your opponent is just really not having fun trying to attack or block into your board so i think trail of mystery is a pretty busted super powerful build around and we're gonna just 
dive on dive into that kind of strategy now which means we want to be heavier green than anything else because green is what's going to give us the mana fixing all of this trail of mystery to find off color stuff so maybe taking the green morph card like woolly loxodon would be nice here although there's a really powerful three color spell with the soul tie soothsayer but the other thing that's nice about taking morph cards really highly is no matter what's going on with our mana cost we just spend three mana and play it as a two two even if it's completely off color from what lands we've drawn we can still cast it so i think loxodon looks pretty good here if we weren't trying to hop onto the trail of mystery stuff there's like a really great white common this mardu horde chief again that two three stat line just lines up really well against morph and this also spits out another one one if you attack so it's just real good stats for the mana cost pick number three now there's a bear companion five mana for a two two and a four four lots of stats for the cost that's pretty good dragon throne might be okay a lot of mana to dump into it but this is a bit of a slower format there's no morph in this pack, so it's really just companion, throne, or a dual land. Although, the only dual, ran, dual land that looks helpful for us here is the green-white one. Probably trying to not play black at least, so we're just like four colors, which makes things a bit easier. So it's probably really greedy. I'm probably supposed to take lands much higher than this. Oh, we've got an X mana counterspell now, another morph card, or a green blue or white blue land. Okay, green blue looks really, really good as fixing. I think we have more green and blue spells than any other color right now, so I'm actually going to take the Thornwood Falls over this decent morph dork. Um, but I really want to make sure I've got some dual lands in this deck. So let's grab a Thornwood Falls. Pick number five, another morph creature, another morph creature here. There's a really fun blue red spells build around with a goblin slide. But that's not what we're doing here. We're on that morph build around strat. So. This is our three mana morph stack here. Black white duel or a morph creature I think look the best here. I take the morph creature again. And I'll take the green one over the red one. So I think we're trying to be deeper into green. Highland game looks like really bad for the mana cost, but this is for two reasons. One, the set's pretty old, so creatures were just weaker back then. Um, but then the second is that this lines up pretty favorably against morph creatures. Three mana, two twos. So you attack in with your two one and you're trading into their morph body. So your two drops trading into their three drop and gaining you some life. There aren't really any morph creatures that can flip up and be bigger than two toughness. Or at least bigger to like eat a 2 2 until you have like five mana up. Uh, Become Immense is a pretty nice combat trick. Delve is a mechanic that lets you reduce your mana cost by exiling cards from your graveyard. So if you build around it, this is the Soul Tie mechanic, so the green, blue, black mechanic. If you build around it with some self mill and stuff, you can play quite a few of these delve cards and get some great cost reductions. If you don't build around it, you can still run like one or two delve cards and get a pretty significant discount on them later in the game. If you top deck a treasure cruise late in the game when you've already traded off a bunch of creatures, you can often cast this for just a few mana and maybe have the mana up after you've drawn your three cards to also cast one of those spells that you've drawn into. So like treasure cruise, and uh, Become Immense, these are the kind of cards I think I'd play one, maybe two copies of in basically any deck, even if I don't have self-mill. So we'll go for a second one there. Embodiment of Spring is probably okay in a really splashy deck here. It's a lot of mana to invest just to get one land, but you're probably blue-green splash Red and white, mostly. Oops. <laughs> we'll take a Force Away there. I don't hate that. I already... I talked a big game on the Force Away. Um, yeah, I don't hate that. I was mainly considering, though, that card that lets me pick something up from a grave as maybe a good option. But it would be really hard to cast, so there's that. We could play one of these banners. These are really mediocre. They don't line up well in your mana cost, especially in a morph-heavy deck, because we're always playing a 3-mana 2-2 two -two on turn 3. I think I'll just take the 2-1. Now we'll take a Soul Tie Flare. Just blue-green at the core.
All right. Pack three, pick number one. My trail of thought has been lost. I don't remember what I was trying to wrap up there. We've got some great stuff here. So these plus one plus one themes, these are in the Abzan deck. The Outlast mechanic lets you tap your creature, put a counter on it at sorcery speed. So you can juice them up with plus one plus one counters until you drop something like a Tusk Guard Captain that just buffs your whole board because now your whole board has trample in the, in the uh, Abzan decks, which is super sweet. Um, so that's really cool. But I think we got to just take a triome here. A three color land looks really nice for a deck like this. Although this is mainly just green and blue. We don't have any black spells yet, but I still think a green blue duel is pretty nice with a tiny bit of added flexibility of maybe giving black when we need it. If we draft like an abomination of Gadul, that could be a thing. Uh, mediocre removal with Savage Punch. This is really good in the right deck that has a bunch of Alpine Grizzlies, a bunch of three mana, four power creatures, but I don't think the Super Morph deck is going to be that kind of deck. Might be okay late game. Right of the Serpent is a million mana, six mana to blow something up. I think I'd rather just grab an Abomination. Zero removal spells the deck. Let's go. Ooh, Secret Plans. This is exactly the kind of build around you want for a green blue morph deck, and we've got the rare build around too. This gives all of our face down creatures plus zero plus one, so our morphs beat their morphs every time. Our three mana two twos are three mana two threes, and every time we flip one of them up, they're a two for one. We draw a card off of them as well. Secret Plans is beautiful in the green blue deck, and we're really happy to see that. Um, now I think I need to take the blue-red Swiftwater Cliffs dual land, because we've got a good chunk of red in here and blue. So this is a very useful dual land for us. Taking it over some decent morph creatures to slap in here. But that looks awesome. Pack three, pick five. I've already got one treasure cruise. I don't think I'm playing multiple. There's a cheap little morph dork. It's a banner. Bounce spell and a little aggro dork. I'm not gonna be heavy enough into red to want a one mana red creature, I think. Let's just take the bounce spell, I guess. Another force away. Pick six. I will happily take a snow horn rider. This is a big, big morph creature to flip later in the game. Five, five trample once you flip it. Let's go. Smoke teller also fine again. Two mana creatures that trade into three mana two twos are a lot better in the set than they look like, because there's a lot of 3-mana 2-2s. Two -twos. Pick number 7. Another big Delve card. I'd have to cut one of them, probably, because I don't have any Delve enablers. So, Become a Man's Treasure Cruise, Hooting Mandrels. I only really play one of these. One or two of them. But there's nothing else I'm going to play in here, so I'll take the Mandrels. Another Snowhorn Rider, real happy to see that one. We can probably cut down to just blue, green, splash the red, make our mana a lot easier because we didn't get a lot of dual lands and triomes that I really don't want to play banners with so many three mana spells in this deck. So we try to focus up on green, blue, splash red. Just go teamer rather than a million colors at this point. Another, do I want another wetland sandbar? Probably not. I've got three two mana two ones. I don't think I need a million in this format. I'll take an Inoc Tracker for another morph. Now a Canyon Lurkers for another morph. And some nonsense to cut. You know, I probably still splash in the Flying Crane technique. But the only other white card is just the white morph dork, so. It's probably the only white splash. I just play a single planes and then try to pick it up off of a trail of mystery if I'm lucky. That might be a little greedy, but I think that is just such a finisher. I guess we have enough cards that um, that just like playing the three mana two two morph dorks. That even if I rarely flip the weapon master, just adds to the morph count, which could be fine. I want to just go all in. Whatever. This is my like first time back in the format in over a decade. I didn't play the set a whole ton. Never did anything like this. So let's just go all in and just see how it pans out here, I guess. Let's cut the purse. Um, The mandrels. 
Right, 18 creatures? Really a lot of creatures. Maybe cut Abomination? Although I've got an opulent palace. Nothing else. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11. All of our three drops except the Knuckle Blade are morphs. Yeah, I'll cut probably Abomination and one more morph. Maybe one of the two mana two ones. Just be slower. Oh, sure. Let's cut a two mana two one and just be a slow deck here. Four more cuts. 16 creatures. I feel like 15 is probably fine for this. Still. Let's have two two drops and then we'll cut one of the weakest of these morph cards. Maybe a Canyon Lurkers here. Because it retains the two toughness, which means it's not really breaking through almost any creatures. It's not getting through two drops or three drop morphs or anything. Three cuts to go. I guess with Treasure Cruise, we drop Weave Fate. I like the idea of like digging through our deck, trying to find secret plans and Trail of Mystery is really huge payoffs. So I like card draw for that, in theory. But I do have to cut something, and we probably do want 18 lands, because our mana curve, it's not going to be whatever it says it is, because we have so many 3 drops, but we really need to hit 3 mana turn 3, and then 5 mana turn 5, because we need the 3 mana to play all these morphs, and most of these are flipping for 5 plus mana. The archers for 5, the mystic for... Oh, the Mystic's only three. That's interesting. Okay, the Archer for five, the Tracker for five, the Snowhorn Riders for five, the Weapon Master for five, and that's only flipping if we trail the Mystery to pick up our planes. Um, yeah, no, we need a lot of mana in this. So I should cut four cards instead of just three. Let's cut a Weave Fate. Let's just go double Force Away. Let's cut double Chill. And then, whatever. I'm just going to do nothing but three drops. We'll cut another sandbar and throw in another probably forest here. 12 green cards, 13 blue. Five, six, seven green sources right now. One, two, three, four, five, six blue sources right now. Five, six red sources. Two white. Two white sources, one trail of mystery is basically three white sources for the splash of flying crane technique. Probably where it does need to be. This is probably the actual mana base. Seven, six, six, two. I could probably cut another red for another green. I think that's reasonable. Okay, we'll do that. And uh, this is the mana base. This is the deck we're going to be running. It's going to be a crazy time for our first draft of Cons of Tarkir. All right, here we have a look at the completed deck list for today. We're on a green blue morph deck that is splashing a good chunk of red. So kind of like teamer morph, but also with a tiny white splash for the huge finisher of flying crane technique. So no matter what's going on with our mana cost, we have a million three mana two twos thanks to the morph mechanics. So just for three generic mana, three mana of any color, we're plopping down some two twos. And our opponent basically can't ever guess exactly what we have face down because we have so many different options to flip up later in the game when we hit the right colors and amounts of mana for them. So a lot of morph shenanigans going on here and a couple cards that make them really powerful. With Trail of Mystery, every time we play a morph creature, we get to pull out a basic land from our deck to help get those splashes more consistent. And when we flip up our creatures, we're giving them plus two, plus two to make winning combat very easy. 
We've also got the secret plans, which is going to buff all of our face down creatures to make our morphs two threes, which plays really well in this set. Because there's a lot of two mana two ones and stuff that people will play because they trade profitably into morphs. Not anymore if our morphs are two threes. And also there's just a lot of morphs. So our opponents will be playing their own three mana two twos. But ours are three mana two threes to win those fights. Also, every time we flip one of them face up, we're drawing cards, turning them all into two for ones, which will be incredible. So super happy to have Trail of Mystery and Secret Plans in here. The green blue archetype in the format is really centered around morph stuff, and we really went for it here. So it should be interesting to see. But on top of all that, we have a little bit of interaction, a couple bounce spells to slow our opponent down, a master the way to kill a smaller creature, and then our just big high value plays like Savage Knuckleblade being a super beefy creature, Bear's Companion being a lot of stats for the cost, and Flying Crane Technique as a huge finisher. So really excited to see how the deck plays, really just excited to see how the format plays in general. Basically a brand new format to me, it's been a long time since I drafted it, and I only drafted it a few times, so just pumped overall, just really excited for whatever happens. But without further ado, let's just head into the gameplay and see what on earth is going to happen here. Here we are for game one with a perfectly reasonable hand for this deck, I think. Two mana, two one into a morph, and we've got all three of our most important colors to flip these things into five fives late game. Playing against green, black, at least, they start with Jungle Hollow, so the most likely three color pairs are green, black, white, and green, black, blue, and they did follow up with a Scoured Barons to have green, black, and white, so that is Abzan over there. Drop our Highland game turn two, drop a Morph turn three, play our Tap Land on turn four now. Ooh, they might be four or five color shenanigans here. They've got four colors on board already. Green, black, white, and red. I imagine a morph is coming down here, which is where Highland game plays really well. Nope. It's a two mana, two one that hits the board tapped. Never mind. Okay. Well, our weakest morph is the Stalker, so we probably just load that out up front because I wouldn't hate trading that into the Skull Hunter, but I probably still don't want to do that. And it's not like dramatically worse than Snowhorn Rider. To where if it does stick around and we flip it, we're still kind of cool with that. But if they have the removal to clear out our morph card before we have... The mana to flip it, we'd rather this one die than any of these other three. And if they get some really good aggressive stuff going, we'd rather trade this face down 2-2 two -two than the other ones. Ooh, another Skull Hunter. Alright, solid value for our opponent. We do need mana pretty badly. So, it is rough to discard a land here. But we can cast all these as just two twos until we hit the mana, so I'll ditch the forest. We've got an 18 land deck here. We may draw another land in time. And they do have the debilitating injury to clear out our creature anyway, and we did hit the land, and it's the white source, which is kind of beautiful. Okay. Probably have to trade off the Highland game at this point now that they're threatening four damage a turn off these attacks. They just have a million copies of Skull Hunter. That's going to be pretty rough for us. Keep getting two for ones here. Right, there's a Wind Scarred Crag. There's a Mardu Banner for fixing. Okay. So we can now run out a morph or we can try to flip up this morph on blocks and the really cool thing about morph you might not know is that if i spend the mana to flip this up our opponent can't respond it just happens so they can't shoot this for two damage when i try to flip it up for five it's just immediately a five five and they can't respond to it now once it's flipped into a five five they can do whatever they want before it deals the combat damage or anything but uh they can't like debilitating injury this 
if I guess if that was an instant. So that's not even a good example. But they can't just like minus two minus two at instant speed to it in response to me trying to flip it. Air of the Wilds. Ooh, a death toucher. Well, that's trading. Okay. Feels like I would. I'd be fine trading this archer with a death toucher. But getting a first strike blocker on board is also pretty nice. Or like flipping this up when they try to block it. Right? If I play this as a morph attack in and they try to block with their death toucher, flipping to a first striker is going to be nuts. I have to be less mana efficient this turn, right? Like instead of just jamming out a 2 5, I have to just play a 2 2. Face down. But that is probably fine. Because we're taking two damage here, probably. If they don't have a big removal spell for the Snowhorn Rider. And by big removal spell, I mean big removal spell. All of the common removal spells in this format, it takes like five, six mana to kill a 5-5. Five, five. Okay. So now we can do the first strike flip. Which is really good at eating stuff. So we attack in, and if they don't block, we just don't do the thing. If they do, then we'll eat the thing. Okay, this is fine. This is a good play from our opponent. It forces us to flip, and then they don't uh, lose the creature. They don't lose the Death Toucher. They do lose the 2 1, which is something. So it looks like our opponent's every color but blue for now. Ooh, they got the Kintree Invocation with the 0 5. Create a creature with uh, power toughness equal to the highest toughness amongst their stuff. Master of the Way is a good draw here. We can kill one of these 2-2s two and draw a card. This 5-5 five five is a little sketchy for me. This is sorcery speed, so I can't combat trick it to kill 5-5 five five with the first striker. Probably just going to start jamming these out. Just hard casting them soon. Yeah, I can only kill one of the 2-2s. Two -two's. I don't really have more removal in this deck, so... Like, trading into a 2-2 two -two Death Touch and trampling over a little bit seems pretty fine to me. Or just trading into a 5-5 five -five so I don't have to worry about it. For now. Alright, cool. So clear out that one. Let's just clear out the other Death Toucher. I could wait. Cast nothing just so that next turn I can deal 5 damage to their 5-5 five five with this thing. But if I hit a land next turn, I'd rather just play a 6-7 against a 5-5 five five anyway. And I hit the land, so let's get that out there. If they make us discard a card again, we're discarding the 2-5. We're going to keep the land with a 7-drop in hand. Although, again, we could morph it and flip it for 6, but... I still think additional mana looks pretty nice. All right, we're taking five. Get booped to 13. All right, I mean, this is our first... Ooh, Treasure Cruise with five engrave? Such a nuts card. If you just run, like, one copy. I accidentally smacked the mic. I got so excited. This is my first game of the format, but I gotta say, this is a really nice change of pace from Lost Caverns of Ixalan so far. This is some... We're just doing stupid nonsense, and we haven't been completely crushed for it. So that's nice. I don't really attack into this parapet. Yeah, I mean, they need pretty incredible removal by this format standard to kill a 6-7. So that should hopefully hold things off. If it doesn't, if they like attack it and then combat trick or something, I guess that makes Treasure Cruise a little cheaper. So we can cast something else alongside it more easily. Alright, cool. No attacks. Let's go. Opulent Palace is fine. More mana is always fine. So five cost reduction, so it's three mana draw three here. Feels pretty good. We do it like this. Yep. How do I do this? Just click on them. 
Nice. There's the Trail of Mystery. That is fantastic. I mean, as long as I don't mill myself out by hitting every land. But that seems incredible to me. Now we play an untapped land and slap one of these down. Doesn't matter too much which. I think I'll slap down the, the one that I'm more happy to flip soon. Already got double red, double blue, quadruple green. I don't think it really matters what basic I take, but we're definitely taking one. Let's just get the last green source. Have plenty of our main color. I'm at 12 life. I'm going to just hold up the defenses here for a little longer. Just making sure they really can't declare an attack for the rest of this game. Because as long as I'm not taking more than this little one chip damage a turn, I think we're definitely taking over the long game now that we have Trail of Mystery to dig all our lands out of our deck. And to make all our flips super dangerous, giving the extra plus two plus two. So there's a Ponyback Brigade for our opponent, which gives them plenty of chump blockers. And if they have any of the spells that buff the entire board on an attack, that's a lot of damage they're threatening to get in with. Speaking of a lot of damage, become immense. Only one card in our grave, but we've definitely got the mana to just cast it without delving, so. Uh, I need five mana up for this one, five mana up for this one. If I do this, I've got exactly five. One, two, three, four, five. So yeah, morphing out. Grab a land just to get it out of there. Uh, but I will play a tap land here, because five mana is enough to cast Become Immense or flip either one of these. Uh, so I don't need an untapped land this turn. I'm a little scared of giving them of them giving the whole board like plus two, plus oh. But I think I'm still supposed to chip in and hold everybody else up. Just like one attacker here. They probably chump with a 1-1 one, one, and then we just trample over, which is cool with us, because it's going to be some big trample. Six damage getting over. Yeah, very nice. And then we have a big trampler attacking in again with Become Immense as backup to either kill a lot of their creatures or just kill them. I guess it can't possibly be lethal next turn if I just attack with the one creature, because that's 11 trampling damage. So even if they didn't block at all, they'd still be at 2. But it's still looking pretty good. There's an arrow storm just straight to the face to speed up the archer's parapet here. If they have a second arrow storm in... Oh! Scratch that. I was going to say, if they have a second arrow storm in hand... This is going to be the most disappointing ending to this game, but now it doesn't matter. Nothing really matters. Because that is a flying crane technique, completely stealing this game. If our opponent did have a second arrow storm to shoot us, because then they'd be mega dead. Or then we'd be mega dead, sorry. Because they shoot us for one here to put us to five. Next turn they cast an arrow storm and ping us again. But flying crane technique off the top, that'll just do that. That'll just be nuts. Oh, and one of the really cool things about Morph, the way that it works in digital magic, like Magic Online and Magic Arena, and it works this way in Paper too. but once the game is over, you have to show your opponent what all your Morph cards were so that your opponent knows that you weren't cheating and like playing a basic land phase down as a 2-2 because you were flooding out. So uh, you get to see all the different tricks your opponent had lying in wait, see exactly what they were playing around with, so that's kind of cute. Uh, yeah, I mean, huge draw at the end with the Flying Crane technique. I'm really interested to see if they had the second Arrow Storm in hand with how aggressively they played that. Maybe they were still just trying to get chip damage in with the Parapet. They were just speeding up that clock. But it's very possible they just had two copies of this thing to kill us. 
next turn they wouldn't even, wouldn't even have had to use the parapet they could have like trump attacked with a goblin to get the raid triggered deal five damage instead of four yeah aerostorm is spooky aerostorm is very spooky i think this is a fantastic red common because it's a beefy removal spell that can also just lava axe your opponent in the face for the last bit of damage you need so well we're only one game down and uh it was a very enjoyable game both of us kind of nerdled around for a while our opponent found some really nice early raid triggers for their discard spells I guess they only did that like the one time, but even just two mana, two, one, discard a card once, that felt really nice in this format. Like a beefy skullcap snail that attacks into morphs. Pretty scary. Because I think in this set, at least in our deck, having extra lands in hand is actually pretty valuable late in the game because we have so many five, six mana morphs to flip up. So discarding lands early game to a little each opponent discards a card style effect is actually kind of rough. So yeah, cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Game one. I'm hoping this format uh, keeps playing out like that because that was fun. I mean, I did win, so <laughs> that that's always going to be a little factor that ups the enjoyment. But also it was nice and slow. Everybody did whatever they wanted, really. We were both just a bunch of multicolored goop piles, which is also cool. Game two's looking nice so far. Opponent doesn't have a two drop. The game doesn't start till turn three a lot of the time. So just playing a two mana two one like Highland game is actually legitimate, even though this card would be complete trash in any modern draft format. It's so interesting. It's so interesting to look back on the stat lines of cards and see how much weaker at least the low mana value spells were than they are nowadays. Three mana, two, one flying prowess looks reasonable to me. Doubt we're sending the morph in here now. We just play another morph and send in the Highland game and they're not gonna wanna trade. Drop the tracker. Get another green source. Next turn, we'll have the five mana to flip either morph. So whichever morph they block, we flip up and go to town. One thing I am noticing that kind of feels like a thing this game, at least, that I might be a little worried about is that, uh, I mean, this is always a thing in best of one magic, but the play draw differential how how good it is to be on the play versus how good your win rate's going to be on the draw. That might be pretty awkward in this format, because being the first person to make it to five mana for five mana morph flips, I think is, is always going to be kind of important in this set. At least in grindy mirror matches. And there's what I was talking about with that force away. When we drafted it earlier, it seems like because you have to invest that three to play your morph and then five later to flip it, having one of your morphs that you flip up bounced like that is a pretty big swing in tempo. Sure, I can just recast it next turn, but that's so much less stats on this board against our opponent here. This would be really bad if we didn't have the six land in hand and now I had to like re-morph it. Although I suppose there's an argument for doing that. Because I get to remorph it and force away in the same turn. If they tap out for some big dork, then sure, we'll do it. All right, they arrow storm our 3 3 first strike. That's fine. Hello, flying crane technique. All right, they still only have the 2 1 on board, so we're not casting a force away. Just gonna drop the snowhorn rider naturally, hard cast it. If they don't do anything about the Snowhorn Rider, I do like that these draw a card and discard a card now. That is the teamer mechanic ferocious. Once you'd have creatures of power four or greater on the board, if you do have them on board, you do big stuff. River Wheel Aerialists, Flyer with Prowess. So I can't kill them with Flying Crane Technique anymore, can I? Yes, I can. 
because they block Snowhorn Rider and we hit for four off of this, which puts them to six. This we hit them for five. Oh, no, I can't. We put them to one off of Flying Crane Technique. I think I'd rather force away Insult Eye Flayer there because we still put them to three. I put them to three instead of one, but now I have three creatures on board post-combat. This feels pretty good to me. Draw a card, discard a card, discard a forest. Send in for seven and drop a Sultai Flayer. Ooh, Rugged Highlands to gain a life. Not the worst land to have here. Unless they have seven mana worth of plays right now. Then it would be rough hitting the tap land. But if they only have six mana stuff they want to do anyway, gaining a life is some tiny amount of breathing room. Set adrift. Bounce the Snowhorn Rider. And they're just dead to a force away. We've got five power on board. Force away that Wind Scout, because they're tapped out. And jam. Again, could have Flying Crane Technique uh, as well for a way to win that game. But we'll just do the simpler route. Pre-combat, force away to attack in unblocked. I guess pre-combat Flying Crane Technique works as well. I don't have to do that instant speed, so yeah. Either way's fine. Either way's very lethal, and we are 2-0 heading into game number 3. Ooh, game three, we get that secret plans, which is going to be really nice. We only have one morph in the hand right now, but that is very cool. Very, very cool for the future. I think I have to jam it out turn two instead of playing Highland game, which is a little weird. And we don't get any value from the black source, so we actually just get the life gain first. This is just another green blue duel in this deck. As far as I remember. Okay. There's a red source. Yeah, and now Highland Game just doesn't even get in for damage anyway. So now I don't even have to feel bad about just going Secret Plans turn two. Otherwise, I would have been like, ah, I might be losing damage just dropping a Highland Game. But now we're not. We wouldn't have been hitting through this anyway. All right, opponent is on Abzan, black, green, and white. And they are doing your general Abzan curve. And here's where Secret Plans is already giving us value. Because that's a 2-3 against their 2-2, two -two, so they don't get any attacks in here unless they kill our morph creature. Or if they have like a combat trick in their hand or something. Another morph from our opponents. Ooh, Savage Knuckleblade. Costs 5 to flip this, so I believe we drop that Savage Knuckleblade. I guess I could have played a mountain and hasted it in here. Yeah, that was probably better. Oops. I didn't think I was ever going to have the perfect just red, red, blue, green, but we had it there if I played Mountain for a turn. I just wanted to get my tap land out of the way. Since I figured out oh, three mana creature, we'll play a three mana creature in the tap land and then have the five mana untapped next turn. That's a lot of morphs over there. That is a lot of morphs. Uh... So Knuckleblade can be a 6-6, six, six, so they just can't block Knuckleblade. Period. I guess I can like triple block the 2-3 here. I think we can jam both of these in. Although, then they crack back for like 6 and probably flip one up and go crazy. Interesting. I'm not certain what I want to do here. Maybe we just attack with Knuckle Blades, so I'm still threatening to eat one of these. If they don't hit the 5th mana to get a big flip. And then even if they get a big flip, this is going to be a 2-5 when I flip it, so it might survive. Because the black-green-white morph common is a 4-4 four, four lifelinker for 5. So I could survive that, but then I'm never racing them against a 4-4 four, four lifelink. This is interesting. I think I just send in the Knuckleblade and hold all my mana up. For Knuckleblade nonsense. Uh-oh. Is it the one that flips for free into a Death Toucher? That'd be kind of gross. Although I can put this back in my hand. I really want to 
Oh, it is. It's the uncommon. Yeah, that's pretty disgusting. Uh, I think they've just got it here, because even if I put it back to my hand, like, I don't have a lot of removal in this deck. I'm just going to end up trading into the Death Toucher sometime later anyway, so I might as well just do it now. Death Toucher's still going to be sitting there. Start getting some secret plans card draw. Hopefully draw some more morph creatures and just keep chaining them together to grind out the long game with value. Pass turn. Well, let me draw my card because you can't respond to this. They can respond to the draw card trigger, but I still draw it. All right, yeah, too late. Drew my one card at least. And it's a force away. We have a flying crane technique, so now the game plan is to get 11 power on board. I don't really have a way to do that, other than just draw more creatures, idiot. <laughs> that's the game plan. Just, just draw more creatures, doofus. So that's our plan. Let's draw more creatures. And then we're going to flip one of these into a 4-4 lifelinker, and then we're going to need so much more power. I guess I've got the force away when they do that to slow them down for a turn. Okay. All right. Outlast the Ancestor. That's fine. That means they don't have the 5-up to flip the 4-4 lifelinker if they have that card. Now, we do get hit a little by the downsides of running 18 lands here, but we had the upsides in those first couple games. We really needed all that extra mana. It was really helpful to just have 3 mana turn 3, 5 mana turn 5, and so on. But here we are definitely flooding a bit for it. Alright, yeah, keep outlasting. I'm cool with it as long as they're not gaining life. Although they're also giving their whole board reach, which is not good. Not their whole board, but all their plus 1, plus 1 counter creatures. Okay. Set in a 2 6. They want to combat trick away the archer. Go for it. Now oh, they just want to trigger Skull Hunter. That's fine. I've got extra lands. Yeah, that should have been easy to figure out because they revealed the Skull Hunter for their black morph card anyway. Cool. All right, Mystic of the Hidden Way. That's pretty exciting. I think I'd be a bit more excited to hit a four power creature. But this lets me chip in for a little bit of damage early. So that I don't need as much power on board to kill them with Flying Crane Technique, because it is completely unblockable. And it is threatening to flip into a really big blocker, so they might just not even declare attacks here, even though they might have reasonable ones if they knew that this is just a 3-2. But I am going to flip it now and start poking them with it. Whittle down that life total. I only need 9 power on board after one attack from this. And there is that power. So poke for 3... And I don't think I morph this, because I can play it and have Force Away up immediately, but if I morph it, that costs 8 total to play and flip. So I think I just show them the 5-5, five, five, just so that Force Away draws and discards a card guaranteed. They gain 1, they're up to 19. Send in the Long Shot Squad. We just force that away, draw a card, discard a card here. I guess we see if we can get them to cast a combat trick first. That'd be really good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. Now we draw a card, discard a forest. They do have the mana up to recast the squad to still have a reach creature here. But they're tapped out from everything else. So, if we flying crane technique, they block this. 
which is five, but then I trample over, because I hit for five, then I hit for two and trample over the rest. So five, then soak up two, trample for three, that's 16. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Not quite there. So how about we clear out the card that gives reach to really make sure we get there next turn, and then just chip in with the unblockable creature again. That feels pretty solid to me. And in case we hit another force away, I'll keep this forest for the drawn discard. So we've got one issue here. The issue is that they could flip reach creatures or flyers because they have all this mana up. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 28 potential damage though. I mean, even if they survive this, all of our creatures are still up as blockers, and they're probably at, like, 3 life or something. They don't have untapped blues, they don't have a counter spell. I think it's better to do this, because there are some board wipes in the set, and this gives them less time to draw into those. So there's, like, Doom Blast in their color trio. That's green, white, black, and 4. They choose one creature on the board and blow up everything else. And it would just feel so disastrous if I postponed Flying Crane Technique just because it's not quite lethal and then they top decked a Dune Blast because then I would just lose a game I had no right to lose. And it could be pretty comparable if they had like End the Hostilities, which is just a five mana white rare, uh, just destroy all creatures, period. Now that we could come back from and still win, but if they hit like Dune Blast, we would just straight up lose that game and it would have been disastrous. But here it's like they need... They need to like flip up a reach blocker and have a removal spell in hand, and even then we're probably still in a winning position after this turn, so I think we just cash that in. Less opportunities for them to draw into something that flips the game back in their favor. So we are now 3 and oh, heading into game number 4, having an absolute blast so far, and uh, we'll see if that can continue. Here we are for game number four with probably our best hand mana-wise. Now there are some aggro decks in this format, obviously not as aggressive as modern aggro decks, but anything in the Mardu color trio, red, white, and black, can be a nice low to the ground little warriors deck. Two mana two ones, two mana three twos available at uncommon, and so on from there to just beat down. So against that kind of deck, might be a little awkward not doing anything till turn 3 with the morph, but I think against pretty much anything else, this hand looks phenomenal. And they are green-blue, so I'm liking how things are looking so far. The Trail of Mystery to set up perfect mana throughout the game, and also every single morph creature is a guaranteed 2 for 1, drawing us a land when we play it, at the very least. Our opponent's got a really solid start with their Jeskai Elder here. Draw a card, discard a card every turn, because we can't really afford to try to block that with a morph card, because if they play any instant, even if it's just four mana draw two or something, then this thing's a two three, and it just eats up our two two morph. So opponents on a real good start, even if they aren't like hyper aggro, just two drop into three mana morph creature. And we are going to have to hopefully um, get some pretty good defenses up pretty quick here to stick in this game. So Master of the Way is really nice to have turn 5 at this rate. Uh, I don't hate Morph for Morph trade here. One really important thing to remember about this format, or to keep in mind about the format, is that there aren't going to be any Morphs that can flip up and just eat your Morph until your opponent has like 5 mana. So Morph for Morph trades, pretty viable when they have less than 5 mana up, unless they have like a combat trick in their hands. That's another thing Morph can do. It can like hide your combat tricks like if they had the plus three plus three trample trick there that would have been pretty bad for me but at least we'd still get that out of the way early here Ooh, there's a better creature to kill the tusk guard captain a two three just naturally that's a uh, gives all their plus one plus one counter creatures trample okay next weakest creature i guess we go for woolly locks it on here right or sorry glacial stalker here 
keep saying exactly what I don't mean. I don't get the auto taps, but I guess it doesn't matter. I don't have the delve mana for the become immense anyway, so we'll hold up red. We'll just be as confusing as possible. Uh, I don't have double blue yet, but I don't think I need double blue for anything in this deck. Not that I need triple green, but I do have more green spells than anything else, so it might be nice. Yeah, I'll just get another green. It's whatever. This Master of the Way is going to be massive here. If they play something beefy, it's still going to be able to kill it, because I have so many cards. Just thanks to Trail of Mystery replacing a card in hand every time I've played a morph. It's also going to make Force Away really good if we draw either of those. Draw a card, discard a card, super nice. We're going to have plenty of land sitting around. We will draw well more than we need this game. Alright, would I rather kill a Morph? Or a Tusca Guard Captain? This is kind of another, like, mystery box, the set. Of, like... I could kill a Tusk Guard Captain, or I could kill anything. It could even be a Tusk Guard Captain. Well, not really, because this card doesn't have Morph, but you know what I'm getting at. It could be anything under there. It might be better. It might be better than the Tusk Guard Captain. Because they have the five mana up now, so odds are this thing flips and eats my Morph. Unless I hold the mana up for my Morph. Instead of playing Master the Way, but I imagine we gotta just Master the Way here. Yeah, I'm just going to master the way. I'm just going to kill the morph. Let's see what it is. A 4-5. Alright, yeah, 4-5 is better than the card by a little bit. Not a ton, but a little bit. Should probably be chipping in for 2. Right, because I'm not realistically going to attempt to block the Jeskai Elder. The only thing I gain by holding up the 2-2 two -two is I'm, like, threatening to block the Jeskai Elder. So if our opponent wants to play very safely here if they don't have an instant or sorcery or if they don't have an instant in hand then they stop attacking with the elder so i am stopping a damage that way maybe oh there's secret plans for card draw i think i'm already so far ahead in cards i probably just need to jam out a big blocker this turn just play the five five although become immense two cards and graves this cost four mana i could play secret plans and hold up become immense Hmm. If I get, like, Force away when I just tap out for five of that's going to be terrible, but it's also going to be terrible if I try to become immense. So either way, I'm going to get got real hard by a Force Away. I think I'm just going to jam out a big blocker. Worst case scenario here, we're going to make Become Immense really cheap <laughs> as we lose our entire board state. Sultai Soothsayer, that's a really nice card. Grab the best card out of the top four, put it into your hand, put the rest into the graveyard to fuel Delve spells. So basically any Delve spell in their deck is going to cost one mana now because they'll have nine cards in Grave after this pops off. So that's going to be really good for any Delve stuff. All right, we successfully held off the attacks by slamming down the Snow Horde Rider, and I'm really happy about that. Um, now I can Secret Plans, and then Wooly Locks it on face down to pick up an Island for the Force Away. And then I'm holding up Force Away here. Not holding up the Comments, I don't have enough Engraved for that, but... Holding up a Force Away still feels really good. And now we just go to Value Town, where every time I play a Morph, I get a land. Every time I flip a Morph, I draw a card. But it should be pretty nuts. Scout the Borders. Alright, I was going to say I'm like a little worried if this game goes long about potentially like self-milling. But our opponent's doing plenty of that. We're not going to mill before them. They're already down to 13 cards. So they just hit four, 
four lands and a sorcery, so all they got was a land off the scout the borders. It's fine. Although, again, any delve cards in their deck, if they have like a 20 mana delve card, which doesn't exist, but if they did, they could definitely like cast it here. Oh, that's really good. Soul Tide Charm to kill the secret plans. And I don't have the mana to flip either up. Well, there goes our massive card draw. We still pulled out every basic at least, but that is sad. All right, secret plans is gone. Also nerfs the morphs to just two twos again. Yeah, main deck enchantment removal looking spicy for our opponent. I can force away, but I think we got to do that during combat where it's going to be really profitable. Three cards in Graves, so Become Immense costs three, Force Away costs two, these Morphs costs five and six respectively. One, two, three, four, five. If I play an untapped land, I can flip a five, or sorry, I can flip the six drop and also Force Away. So I think I'm playing an untapped land, probably just discarding Opulent Palace to a Force Away so we can keep having as much mana as possible up. Yeah, we're not really getting in right now. I mean, Become Immense... Definitely makes it so they have, like, no good blocks if we just start sending in our big trampler. But I want to have a little bit larger of a board state before I start doing that when we're at 12. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty good. Ice Feather even gets to bounce one of our cards and give them a flyer here. Yep. That's pretty gross. I mean, at least when we replay it, we get another land, so that'll be nasty. There's more value for us. Got eight mana. I can flip either morph and still force away. All right, so they're just attacking in the sky. That's fine. Yep, outlast the captain. Let's flip the more expensive one here. Let's get our six, seven ready. Three to play, five to flip. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mana. I do have the mana to play this and flip it. I kind of hate that I'm going to have to like force away an Ice Feather Aven at this rate. Because then they're just going to be able to bounce another one of my cards and slow me down. I think I have to start chipping in for damage now. I've got a 5-5, five, five, a 4-5 on blocks. Two blockers means block there, block there. Two things get in. We've got a force away too. Well, I can't flip and force away, which is a little awkward. I feel like I can afford to send one creature in though. I'm trying to outrace this Ice Feather Aven really. Unless we're all in on just top decking flying crane kick every game. Uh oh. That's terrible. Crippling chill to lock down a blocker. Probably block Jeskai Elder, bounce the Tusk Guard Captain with Force Away. Then I can even cast Become Immense as well. Two for the Force Away, four for the Become Immense. Don't even have to delve my whole grave to do that. Treasure Cruise, draw three. Digging deep, they're going down to seven cards in deck. I guess I'd still really like to not have to cast Become Immense on blocks. Well, now we just do it, though. I mean, I hit for like 12 on the crackback here. And I really wish I had spent my mana differently, just had one more mana up here. I guess then I wouldn't have played the morph, but if I had one more mana, I could just flip this to counter the throttle and still have the force away up. 
If they have their own force away and I dump all my mana into flipping this, then we just die. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I don't think I can do that. I think I have to become immense and hold up the force away. They're at 16, 6 plus 6, I can do 12 on the crackback if I attack both and flip here. No more instants, please. One time. Oh my god, let's go. All in on top deck flying crane technique every game. Oh, and they're over it. <laughs> we didn't even have to show them the flying crane technique. I mean, yeah, those those tricks actually, I don't even think we needed to draw flying crane technique there because they didn't have the mana to recast the captain if they played a land this turn, which I think they did based on how their swamps look. I think this was their land for turn. So they're in a position where now they cast nothing. I eat their elder. We take the four to go to six, but now the board states are a 6-7 and a 4-5 against a 2-2 two, two flyer and a 2-5. And they have to re-establish a board quickly here. When I also have like a big 5-5 five, five trample morph to flip later. I guess it was already winning. I don't think it was a winning enough position where like they had to scoop there or anything. They were still definitely still in the game. But I think that that turn of blocks actually did get us to slightly favored from a position that I think was definitely losing before that. And obviously top deck and the flying, the flying crane technique just means we, we straight win. We straight win. But uh, yeah, all right. Did not know how that one was going to go. Our opponent had real good prowess uh, nonsense going on with the Elder. There were probably a few turns there where they were attacking in with it and maybe didn't even have the instant in hand, so we could have went for some blocks there and it just got extra damage in that way, but they really set up the draws with that. They had the full delve going on. Really spicy deck from our opponent, but we still get that victory in the end, and we are 4-0 and oh now, guaranteed to be pretty much breaking even at least on our very first premiere draft of Cons of Tarkir. Really sweet way to start things off, but we'll see if we can't keep it up as we head into game number 5. Here we are now on the play for game number five. I want to keep this so bad, but we need a forest so bad. I mean, if we hit any land and we are on an 18 land deck, we have four three mana two twos. And if we hit any green source, we are living in magical Christmas land where Trail of Mystery takes us all the way to town as it did last game. So I got my fingers crossed here for a green source, but any land makes this a perfectly reasonable hand. And we've got 16 out of these 33 cards that are lands, and we just need to hit one in the next two draw steps. So I gotta win one out of two coin flips, hopefully. Uh, oh! Heart Piercer Bow, turn two from our opponent. Ooh, all right. Well, we missed the land drop, but Secret Plans is a really good one if we find the green source. So we've now failed two coin flips. Okay, not green sources. Awkward. Um, I'm going to go for the Mystic, as it is the cheapest creature to flip, and I can flip it without a green source. Although we'd really prefer to flip it after we have secret plans on board. So I think if we draw the forest here... Are they stuck on three? Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so they're also stuck on three, which is monumentally helpful. I was going to say, um, if we draw the forest, the play was going to be Trail of Mystery. So that next turn, I get to play a morph, grab another forest, and play the secret plans in the same turn, guaranteed. Um, but we drew a tapped green source, so that changes things. Probably not a lot, though, because it's still pretty important value to be picking up lands off these creatures. So I suppose we just do the same thing they did and poke them for three, right? Because it's not like we're going to block the Mystic anyway. 
I guess I'm losing a potential card draw off of Secret Plans, but I have three more basics going into my hand. Three card draws off these. A Master of the Ways of card draw. Yeah, no. We just get that man investment out of here. We just jinx them. Now, next turn is guaranteed to be gas. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> if I hit another land, it's going to be gas. Since we hit the tap land here. If it was an untapped forest, then yeah, next turn is going to be gas. We play a morph, get the green source, play a secret plans too. Now it might just be the Trail of Mystery. But if it's a land, it's going to be super, super good. And here's what I was talking about with the... Potential 18 land formats, That's what I've been hearing a lot from Lords Limited, Limited Level Ups, all the podcasts I like to listen to, because five mana is a big number, and we've seen that a lot in this deck. I guess we don't know for sure if they need five mana in their deck for their morphs, but probably for a lot of the big good ones. So let's Trail of Mystery and drop a morph. Pick up a land to guarantee six mana next turn. Should be very good. And they don't have the five mana that they would need to flip up a morph that's big enough to just eat our morph. So I think we just go morph for morph trade on blocks here. Oh god, no. Double Heart Piercer Bow, though? That was one of the really disgusting things you could do in one of the core sets. Because they were commons, I think, and there was a card that would tutor them out. In Cons of Tarkir, this happens a lot less often, because they're uncommon, but if you stack up multiples, they just eat anything on attack, so that's really gross. Ooh. Bear's Companion's pretty nice. I definitely have to do something pretty defensive here. I need to kill the morph for the... Well, I need to play the Bear's Companion to have a 4-4 four, four to block the face down. Or I need to just master the way kill the Mystic here. But now they just attack with this and kill this Mystic. <sighs> Double Heart Piercer Bow when it's uncommon is really, really gross. I guess I could just play a really beefy like 5-5 five, five or something here. It's another option. So at 7 mana, I could cast Master the Way and Secret Plans to be really mana efficient. At 6, I could just go double morph. And that could play real bad. Against the Heart Piercer, any other small removal potentially. Hmm. I don't think I can let them keep the unblockable creature on board, but this morph could be something big. I'm master the way the unblockable card. But we might just be getting got by the double bow here. Obviously, I can't even hold up a block here because they just kill the mystic by declaring an attack. Down to seven. There's a Jeskai Elder. Seven mana, that's a good draw. I can slam a six seven down, or I can play Companion and Secret Plans. Be mana efficient. They just kill the two two Companion with their double bow. But then I have the secret plans set up for future turns, and this plays a lot better if they just have bounce a creature back to my hand off their blue. They just have bounce a creature back to my hand. We're practically dead here if I just play one creature. Although, no, if they have bounce a creature, they just bounce the bear token, kill the bear's companion by attacking, and we're taking just as much damage, like we're just as kind of doomed here. So... I guess it is actually reasonable to try to just establish a beefy blocker. I could even go Knuckle Blade instead of Bear's Companion. 
I don't think that's any better though, right? Because we're still just playing secret plans and I don't have the mana up for any of these abilities anyway. Yeah, no. They've got the bounce, they've got the bounce, and we are doomed. Either way, we play this out. They bounce the token and double shoot the 2 2. All right. Well, rough game, but probably a loss in the end. It's really just the double heart piercer that got us here. That is an insane combo. That's super gross against morphs. Zergo obviously finishing is pretty disgusting, but I think without the double heart piercer, we would have had a legitimate chance here, even against a Zergo at the top. All right. We are four and one heading into game number six. Here we are for game six with a beautiful hand mana wise. None of our big morph payoffs, but just solid stuff to run out on board. Our opponent is on the play. Mole to six here, but a very aggressive deck. Not a lot of playable one mana creatures in this format. Actually, very, very few, but Monastery Swift here is one of the best one drops ever printed. A massively playable, massively aggressive one mana threat that plays super well against morph creatures because it always threatens to turn into that 2-3 body off of one prowess trigger. And yeah, aggro deck on the play with a 2-mana two 2-1 two that also trades into morphs. This does not look like a good matchup for us. Jeskai aggro goblin slide is spooky. Because now every time they cast a non-creature, they also get a 1-1. One -one. But it looks like they have a solid creature count, so hopefully Goblin Slide doesn't like super pop off here. Slow enough deck here, we might need to just force away a Leaping Master to slow them down, force them to recast here. Just to get some breathing room to try to take over in the long game, as our deck is wont to do. So Mystic's not going to help really at all. We're not really trying to outrace them here, we're just trying to survive their Onslaught. So a first striker, a 2-5 reach, these are pretty good blockers, and obviously Snowhorn Rider is the best of the three. So I think we want to play one of the decent ones here. But not the best best one. Because if I curve out naturally, if I hit a land, then I'm going decent morph into decent morph into flip one of them to turn after that. So I don't really want Mystic on board when I'm just not going to want to flip it. I guess I go with the Tracker, because I could also just hard cast the Archer turn 5 as a big blocker against their aggressive deck. But I can't really high, hard cast the Tracker on turn 5. He cast it. They have a Goblin Slide on board, and they are the Prowess color trio. I don't think we can ever take this block, which is a nice free bluff for our opponent. Smart play by them if they don't have an instant or sorcery in hand. I guess instant only sorceries wouldn't work at this point. All right, jam out a morph. It is our turn three. We jam out a morph as well. Actually, again, for that argument I was making of where I can actually just hard cast the archer for five, but not the tracker or the rider, I think I actually morph the rider down here. No, I'll, I'll morph the mystic. I'll morph the mystic here. If I get to five mana and the tracker's still out, I'll flip it. If it's not still out, I'll cast the archer. And then I'll still have the rider for when I hit six mana. So they've got the five mana. So if this is the Jeskai morph card, it's a four, three first strike when it flips and it buffs the swift spear. So let's just put like a, a three, two under the swift spear and that could incentivize them to flip the face down. And buff the swift spear because it gives it plus three plus O. Oh. Although this plays really bad against an instant or sorcery in hand, but again, they could have just bluffed that last turn. I keep saying instant or sorcery, but really it's just an instant. They only have one non-revealed card here. If that one card's an instant, they get us here. But I feel like it's more likely they just flip this into a 4-3 and buff the Swift Spear. And I guess we stop damage either way. 
Do stop damage either way. Man, I'm just realizing how bad this is for us, right? Because if they have the instant in hand, it's like we're just, we're just doomed either way. Because they have like a morph that just flips and eats our dork, or they just have an instant that just gets cast and eats our dork. It looks like this might have been solid here. Oh, it's just a 5-2? Oh my god, all right. We get a free kill, and this isn't one of the cards that actually eats our morph. We can still just trade a 2-2 two -two into it. Well, that was a really nice turn of events for us. Okay. I could be flipping these things, but I think I'm still just wanting to play big beefy blockers to be really stable here. Rather than get a surprise first strike kill on a lurkers or something. I can just trade my 3-2 in it, and I'm pretty fine with that. Also, trading the archer's fine, too. Although they're at 20. We can threaten to kill them with flying crane technique pretty quickly, but we need to find a white source for it anyway, so... Probably don't want to get too aggressive here. Okay. Yeah, let's just, let's just chip with the 1 and play the archer. And have just beefy blocks. The archer, not the greatest against the lurkers, but our face down sure is. There's a tranquil cove for them to gain a life. Crippling chill, the 2-2. Two -two. Alright, I'll take the trade. I'm at 11 and I've got a way better late game than they do, I imagine, so I'm just taking the trade. You got it. Means no blocks for the Leaping Master, but I can block everything else all day long. Six mana, that's a Snowhorn Rider if I've ever seen one. Means I don't even need to block her up unless they top deck another Crippling Chill kind of card. Because they did draw one empty-handed to that Crippling Chill. Not empty-handed, they had one Leaping Master in there, but it's just a blind draw and another blind draw. Now we're just naturally out racing with beefy creatures rather than trying to flying crane technique to end it. But obviously if we hit a planes, then we just mega end it instead. Um, Haste out a knuckle blade, just hold up two twos to block the one one. Actually seems kind of fine. So weird to just see like three mana two twos just actually getting mileage in this format. Like even when we're not flipping the morphs, it's just like, eh, whatever, it's a two two. I'll trade it on blocks. I'll hold off some goblins with that thing. Kill shot on the five five, which gives them another goblin. Pretty solid. It only bounces itself, right? Yeah, I can't save my rider from removal, just my knuckle blade. They did not read Savage Knuckle Blade, and that is unfortunate for our opponent. We will just eat the entire board then. That's kind of a bummer of a way to end it, because that wasn't really... That was just card unfamiliarity from our opponent. Just completely ending that game. Definitely could have gotten some more turns of mileage, but... Happens to everybody. They just didn't see the full text on it, and... We just buff into wiping the board, so I guess that'll wrap up that game a little prematurely. Is what it is. We'll still take that as a victory. We get our fifth win, and we get in the money, no matter what out of this draft from that. So, solid stuff for us value-wise. Just would have been cooler to see a bit longer of a game there in the end. A little disappointing way to end it. Definitely feel a little bad about that one. But... That's value, that's money in the bank. We are at 1,600 gems and four packs out of this event that we spent 1,500 gems to play. So no matter what, we're up in value. We get all the gems we need to draft again right after this. And I'm going to be more than happy to do so. So 
Really, really spicy draft to start things off. We are 5-1, heading into Game 7. Here we are for Game 7. I might mulligan this one. This one doesn't have, like, a huge payoff if we hit the right colors of mana, like we did a couple games ago. The one game that we lost, we kept a, a hand with no green source with some really good green spells. This time we don't even have the really good green spells, so I think we just mulligan this. Just okay cards if we hit the perfect mana. If we don't hit the perfect mana, then we're not really doing anything. Definitely looks much better. The mana looking awesome here. I like Highland Game into Morph into Force Away. But our deck does, again, as we've seen in all these games, really like having 5-6 mana later in the game, so ditching a land also feels a little expensive. But we're on the draw. We're on the draw. This might be dumb, but I'm going to ditch a basic here. Actually, that probably was dumb, because if I was going to ditch a land there, I probably should have ditched the Opulent Palace, so that I could play an untapped land turn 2 and an untapped land turn 3. So even if it's not dumb to... Uh, to ditch a land, it is dumb to ditch the untapped land. That was an incorrect mulligan. Mardu Horde Chief. That is not a bad way to start things off from our opponent. Even unrated, just because, again, that 2-3 stat line lines up really favorably in this format. Basically, every 2-drop is like a 2-1 that doesn't do anything about that. And all the 3-drops are morph creatures that are just 2-2s two that just die to that as well. But, ooh, it's double Horde Chief. We might get rolled by white-black warrior aggro stuff here. I mean, having a Knuckleblade is certainly helpful if they don't have removal, but they're going to have 5 mana up next turn, which means they could absolutely have removal. But getting a 4-4 down is significantly better than just playing a 2-3 right now. I think we have to drop the Knuckleblade. Hope that it holds things off a little bit here. Fingers are certainly crossed. If this holds things off even for one turn, that'll be really nice. Having force aways with the four power creature on board is kind of big. We might even main phase one just to get the card draw. Looking for more mana since I did ditch my lands. Yeah. Problem with that is that we're not playing any more creatures if I do that, but now they've got this thing threatening to flip up. Really trying to get the five mana. That's going to be a huge stabilizer being able to cast a bear's companion. Now let's slow down the morph. Feet of resistance to counter that. That is really annoying. Feet of Resistance is a premium, premium common. It's been reprinted in a course at one time, and it was completely disgusting there as well. Being able to counter any interaction or win any combat and get a plus one, plus one counter permanently is just filthy. A lot of buzz going on that this is probably going to be the highest win rate common in the entire format. Just as a spectacular combat trick or counterspell or whatever you need it to be really what on earth is this morph i guess it doesn't really matter we're kind of getting rolled either way i probably should have kept mana oh god so they're just black and white here so in black and white it could be a one five flyer a three six two one a 1-4 lifelink, a 5-3? I feel like Knuckleblade trades into most of what it could be. Knuckleblade also just eats a 2-3 if they don't have a trick, which is something. Yeah, the fact that this gave a plus one, plus one counter while it countered our bout spell was super gross because now I can't even like Highland game to force them to flip here. Yeah, this card was... We were already in a bad spot, but this is a game swinger right there. Yeah, we really don't have a lot of action here. Let's just take 
probably five plus damage, probably like eight from flipping this. Oh, it's the rare that just completely kills us. Okay. Fair enough, get bombed out of it here with Master of the Pearls buffing the entire board, so there are zero favorable places to block. And we still don't hit that next mana, and I can't even use the Force away for card draw. Alright. Definitely stuff I could have done better. I don't feel bad about not playing around the rare morph card, because that's just statistically not going to happen super often, but I really should have kept the extra mana here, and that might have given us more of a game. I mean, I'm not technically dead, but good god, is this game over. So now they have the board buff with the rush of battle. And this is what I was talking about when I said aggro decks are certainly viable. It's not just four or five color goop like we've been playing with and against frequently. That doesn't matter. There's nothing in our whole deck that wins against this kind of board. Five and two it is, heading into game eight. Here we are on the play for game number eight. Obviously really want to hit a red source, but we've got two morphs no matter what. We'll keep the hand. Three land opener definitely favorable for us. Sultai Flare coming up if we hit any land by turn four. It's pretty likely with our land count here. Start with our weakest morph here against any cheap removal, and they are Abzan, so they could have it, debilitating injury or anything like that. And we just missed the land here. Three draw steps to find one land. That's three failed, basically, coin flips in an 18 land deck. Really unfortunate way to start things off. Because three mana turn three and five mana turn five are massively important, which is why we're interested in 18 lands in this deck. Oh boy. All right, well, this is just not looking good. Just keep poking for two, I guess. But now they have that ever-important five mana. Because they've hit a land drop every single turn. They've also cast a Soul Tie banner. So now they can flip their face down to win against any of ours. Or just cast an Armament Core to really make sure nothing happens with our 2-2s. Two we cannot attack into a 2-7. There's our fourth mana now, which is definitely something. It's not enough mana to flip any of the morphs, but we can certainly drop a Soul Tie Flayer. They're going to flip an Abomination of Gadul, start poking in for three a turn, and setting up their draws, drawing and discarding a card every turn. Pretty nice morph there. We can flip our 2-5 Reach, we'll have a blocker set up for that. We just hit another non-land spell here. So all I can do is force away the Abomination, which isn't even that good right now. I think I'd rather just play another morph card. Although they're green, white, black, they are the the board wipe color trio, where they could have a Doom Blast or end the hostilities to blow everything up. So I don't want to really overextend, but we still have more cards in hand than them, even playing another morph here. So let's slap it down. Down to fourteen. If we can hit a mountain, that's probably our best draw, just master the way the Abomination. But if they just have like a million mana untapped, maybe it'll be better just to flip a 2-5 and try to block. Blue source for our opponents, another face down. They've got basically perfect mana if they're four color and we hit another non-land. So now... I don't even know. I mean, Soul Tie Flare can theoretically gain us a ton of life if it sticks around. So we can we can bleed a bit in the early game here. It locks it on down so I have another blue or green card to flip up if I don't find a red source still. 
later in this game. I really would rather not have to just force away just to stop three and then they immediately get to recast the abomination anyway. Send in the Abzan guide and get two for one here if they don't have a combat trick. And if they do, I mean, I two throw myself into the guide or I two throw myself into a combat trick. Can't really afford to take much extra damage here. Let me do this. See what they got. Cool. So we both gain four. Now I don't have my life gain breathing room anymore, but we actually just one for one traded into their four four life linker, which feels good enough to justify losing the soul tie flare. Keru Lich Lord. That just bombs us out, right? Beginning of their upkeep, they can spend two and a black, return a creature at random from their grave to the battlefield, give it flying trample haste? Yeah. So unless we top deck the mountain here and immediately kill that, we're just losing. I can bounce that at least with the force away, but again, without the draw and discard. That gives us one more turn to draw the mountain before they start activating it, and they're going to get a 4-4 flying Abzan guide and hit us for 7 in the sky next turn if I don't bounce that. So I think we bounce that. Force them to recast it next turn so they don't get the upkeep trigger, and then we have another turn to find Master the Way to try to kill that. And if we don't find it, at least we flip a 2-5 reach on blocks to block one of the flyers every turn. And then we try to flip the next one the turn after that. So I've got four reach power to kill one of the flyers on blocks. That is a miserably bad draw with the mana that we have this game. Okay. Flipping some reach creatures. Flipping some reach creatures for sure. Down to 11. Send in, and I can't kill either of these, so I'm probably supposed to try to stop one more point of damage by blocking the 4-4, four four, even though it gives them the draw discard trigger to do that. I don't know. It might be more worth it to stop them from drawing and discarding and take one more point and go to 7. This parapet, every single point of damage matters a lot. I'm going to stop more damage. Go for the Absan guide here. Ew. Wow, Absan Charm put a counter on two creatures? I'm really surprised they didn't put one on the other flyer. I just went for the armament core in the Absan guide here. That is very, very surprising. But it's still filthy. I mean, they win the combat and leave a plus and plus one counter behind. I have so many lands left in here. Technically only five red sources, I think, but still. All right. I don't think there was a lot we could do in this one. Mana base just catches up to us. We're bound to get at least one loss off of it. A little sad that it is two, but one of them was self-imposed with that mulligan. I think this hand was definitely a keep, though. We just drew pretty bad for it. If I don't flip a reach, I'm straight up just dead, so I have to spend all my mana into flipping my other reach here, which is also just not a winning plan. But it's all I have. And so we could be mana efficient, play a morph in a highland game, but then I'm dying in the sky. Because parapet puts me to seven, then they hit me for five in the sky to put me to two. And then parapet hits me down to one. I guess I technically go to one. Oh. Well. Never mind. Now all their plus and plus one count 
plus one, plus one counter creatures are flying as well. And I, again, don't technically immediately die. I go to one still, because I just chump block the armament core and take five, and then take one from the parapet to go to one, but one life against a parapet, there's no draws that win that game from there. That was just the mana base catching up to us. Not much else to say about that game. There wasn't really much else to do. We did what we could with what we had. And we are unfortunately going to end off at 5 and 3. Not that that's a bad record. That's a pretty fantastic way to start a format. Just would have liked to see the deck do a little better because it was firing on all cylinders early. There were some self-imposed issues with this deck. Gameplay-wise, for sure, we should not have ditched a land in our earlier loss there. I think we might have been able to win that game if we had just all the mana we needed. Um, but I think our third loss, I think that was definitely a keepable hand. It just didn't work out for us. Mana base definitely caught up to us, and that was another self-imposed weakness. We did pass up on a few duels. I don't think there were a ton that were incredible for this mana base. We saw a lot of duels involving black mana, and we don't really care about black mana at all in this deck, but I know that there were at least a few picks during this draft that we could have picked and like picked like a, a blue-red or green-blue duel really highly, and that would have helped the mana base for sure. Maybe make it just more consistent, uh, consistent enough to maybe have had a red source in that last game and bought us the time we needed to try to grind things out with our general just uh, value plays and stuff later on. So some things that we can learn from this deck and do better in the future. Uh, some things that we can learn from the gameplay to do better in the future when you are this kind of super grindy deck you actually just keep the four card hands or the four land hands you don't ditch those lands on the mulligans little stuff like that to learn it's a very very different set very different experience with this kind of deck that we want to leave that much mana in our hand and still drawn to a lot more uh, but I am liking the change of pace. This looks like a really fun set. It's going to be very cool to dive deep into. Check out all those three color pairs. Check out the two color pairs. The two color pairs, of course, being a lot more aggressive when you're not splashing in a third, like we saw from that black-white deck that just absolutely rolled over us. Um, it's going to be a cool format, and I'm super excited to draft it some more. So I guess we're going to go ahead and grab our prizes, our 1,600 gems and four packs of Cons of Tarkir. And uh, we're just going to move on right quick so I can hop into another draft for tomorrow's video. So that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members very much for their support, as well as you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.